on uh, Decentral TV here. Let's get rid of all this stuff. Good stuff. All right. Um, yeah, do you want to see that? Cell phones off. Yeah, signal to turn them off. Got a nice view there. Yeah, it's the uh, it's the Freedom Tower. It's ground Zero down there. Nice, great view. Cool, man. Yeah, I'm going to turn off the mic every time we are. No, I'm going to turn off the mic. Is it good? Yep, it's good. <laughs> All right, off. Yeah. So welcome to another uh, Toronto East Central Bitcoin meetup. Uh, we do this every Wednesday, and we try to get special guests in. And today we're it's great to be joined by Charlie Schramm, who's calling us in from New York. Charlie, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Anthony. Yeah. So, Charlie, I think we're going to start right at the beginning with your first, the first time you heard about Bitcoin. Let's go through the story there, leading up to, uh, leading up to, you know, what what really excited you about it, and then leading up to, I guess, uh, the path towards BitInstant. Yeah, many, many, uh, many, 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 many years ago, uh, light years ago, uh, in a faraway place, um, my parents' basement. Uh, 2000, late 2010, early 2011. Um, uh, I was on an IRC chat room um, in the really earlier days, and and uh, just one of these random people came on the chat room, and and we were just all bullshitting around and talking about about different things, about you know how to set up uh, PGP on your computer, and and we were talking about how to essentially uh, be able to take data and move it from one computer, one place, to another computer, another place, without it being uh, in, in, uh, interfered with or uh, read or uh, anything happened to it in transit. And the only way that you could do that is really encrypt the data before it leaves it, your computer uh, and then have a strong enough password or, or uh, not on any watch list to be able to send the data across, you know, half the, halfway around the world. Um, and then on the person's computer that's getting it, be able to take that email or message or document and decrypt it um, with keys that you guys shared in advance. And someone said, "Wow, you know, I heard of this project that I, you, you know, what someone's taking that capability and and using it in, with money." I'm like, "What? What does that even mean? How do you take money over the internet?" Um, you know, we have PayPal and you have all these different companies that that exist. And he's like, "Well, imagine, imagine if you can." Send value to someone uh, over the over the internet um, from person to person without a, a, a middleman, without a third party freezing your funds, or or taking a fee or taking time delay. And I said it's impossible, you know. And he linked me to the Bitcoin white paper, and I read it, and I said, wow, this thing, this is crazy, and I didn't think it would work. And many people didn't think that Bitcoin could could work in those in those early days. I mean. Many of the re many of the, the people. I mean, part of the reason that we were all involved in, in those days is because we were trying to see how to break it. You know, how how could Bitcoin actually not work? How can it how can it be flawed? How can Satoshi's paper um, exist? Because and and how could it be right? How can this all be something you know that actually can make sense? Um, and so we started all playing around with it and uh, you know setting up. Bitcoin QT on our computers and uh, hacking around and, and emailing people and uh, developers getting in touch and trying to, to, to form some sort of community to see how this thing could can move forward and go what the next step is. And and even in those early days, you really didn't see its potential. In those days, it was kind of early. It was fun. It was, hey, send me 10,000 bits or send 10,000 Bitcoin or whatever this, this, you know, whatever it is. But all of a sudden, you'd see on one person's computer... Uh, a debit of less than 10,000, all of a sudden on someone's computer you see a credit of 10,000. And the ability to do that without having like a, someone in between was just like, whoa, that's that's crazy, that's that's impossible. 
So I said, wow, this thing could really be intense. It could really be crazy. And we all started going on the Bitcoin talk forums and, and engaging and talking and talking about technicalities of it and see how it would work. And, um, and I was talking to a guy in the Bitcoin forums, and one day he said to me, Charlie, um, I have this idea where we can allow people to buy, to buy Bitcoin instantly. And Bitcoin was worth 50 cents a dollar. And, and I said, who's going to really buy it? Like, what are they going to need it for? But people went on the exchanges, and they were buying it, and they were buying it. Um, and we kind of talked over the idea a lot. And a few weeks later, the price, uh, a few months later, the price starts uh, skyrocketing from $2 to $4 to $6 to 12 to 15 to 20 to 25 to 30 to 36 dollars for one bitcoin and then it just plummeted and Gareth turned to me and he said my my partner in, in what would be bit instant and Gareth turned to me and he said wow this thing is something here this is a speculative bubble but people are interested so let's let's try to start a company to see if we can make a, an easy way for people to buy this thing. Because, and this is me saying to him, Gareth, if we can get Bitcoin in the hands of millions of people, if 10 of them say, I want to actually take this and run with it, then we will have succeeded. And most people in, that bought Bitcoin in 2012, 2011, including the CEOs of most of the Bitcoin companies today, will tell you that they bought their first Bitcoins from BitInstant. So getting Bitcoin in the hands of people in those early days was the key. That was our job. Was how do we get Bitcoin in the hands of the most people the fastest way possible? And, uh, and that's how I really got involved in Bitcoin. So a lot of companies having challenges these days, getting bank accounts, getting things set up. How was it back then? Was it, was it pretty easy to get things going because it wasn't even on the radar of banks, setting up your bank accounts? No, the key... The key, the key would to be to have like three or four accounts always on. I mean, the average lifespan, we, we had a joke like the half-life would be like three months for a bank account. And you'd constantly, they'd be getting shut down. I think I've been kicked out of every bank, personally and corporate, uh, in New York. I mean, I can, I can name you ten of them. Chase, Citibank, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, TD, Santander, Citibank, uh, 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 Bank of New York, uh, Bank United, PNC Bank, which I really love PNC Bank, actually. Great bank. Uh, more, just tons of them. We just kept on and off, on and off, on and off. But that's, that's the only way to do it. I mean, you go and you explain what you were doing to the bank branch manager, and he'd be like, yeah, 20 wires a day, cash deposits, sounds, sounds great, just raking in those fees. And then someone above him in his compliance department is like, whoa, whoa. What is going on here? And and then we get shut down, and then we just keep restarting and restarting again. So explain to people who don't know what BitInstant was, and you know how it actually shaped the 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 Bitcoin community because it was the place that people were buying their first Bitcoin. So what was BitInstant? And at its peak, how many um, how many uh, different places did you have active where people could buy Bitcoin? Yeah, in, the, in these early days, there were there was there was one if not two or three places to buy Bitcoin, those were the exchanges. There was no Coinbase, there was no um, uh, Circle or TrueCoin, any of these companies, they just didn't exist yet. No one really had a need for, for retail Bitcoin purchases. It was more speculative trading. And so there was Mt. Gox and Trade Hill and Crypto Exchange and these small little ones that would come up and disappear. But Mt. Gox was the biggest one. And then Bitstamp you know, came around, I think, the end of 2012 or 2013. Um, and that was uh, the best way to buy Bitcoin. And so at first, I said, well, it's too difficult because you need to send a wire uh, or you need to like, do these shady methods of getting money in to uh, these exchanges. And it would take days, if not weeks. And it would be wiring to Japan would take you know, a very long time. So at first, BitInstant decided to be just like a quicker way to get money into the exchanges. And so what we do is we'd have accounts at the exchanges with large dollar reserves, and you'd give us money here, and we give you money there. Um, we'd have, uh, we had retail connections um, at first in all the banks, so Bank of America, Citibank, Chase, and Wells Fargo. You can go and deposit cash into our bank account, and within minutes, you'd be credited that same dollar equivalent minus like 3% fee on the exchanges. And eventually, we made deals with all MoneyGram and Western Union locations. So at our peak, we had about a million locations worldwide, 700,000 in the U.S., and we were we were churning out, I mean we were churning out a million bucks a day depositing people depositing, but it 
later on, as we progressed, the company just started selling Bitcoin directly, and that's what BitInstant became into. We were we were the earlier retail way of buying Bitcoins, not through your bank account, because it was you know you have something like your bank account which is uh, reversible. Cash is not reversible, so people would go cash into Bitcoin, and that would be the fastest way. And and yeah, we were doing we were doing crazy day like a million million a day, two million a day, um, and the company grew. The company grew from me running out of my basement to about 20 people um, at its peak. And then sometime in July, uh, June of 2013, uh, this was about a month or two after FinCEN came out with their first Bitcoin guidance, my lawyers had emailed me and they said, you know, we can't, we, we can't continue going on like this. This, you know, the... We've always operated in somewhat of a gray white, and I think with this FinCEN, we're now more of in a gray black area. And I, and I think they even mentioned that they couldn't even represent me anymore if we stayed alive past that weekend. So that week, that Friday, I made a decision to shut down Ben Instant uh, indefinitely. Um, and uh, but you know, by that point, we'd already had Coinbase and tons of other companies. So my job had had been done for a while at that point. I had kind of stopped taking care of day-to-day -day operations at, at the company. Anyways, I was focusing more on Bitcoin Foundation related things. I was traveling with you, Anthony, to Argentina and we were meeting with Bitcoin companies down there and we were helping them out and we were already more onto our Bitcoin evangelizing than, than working on company stuff. So I wasn't really too sad about it. We didn't owe anyone any money. We, we were probably the only Bitcoin company that shut down without owing any, anyone any money, which I'm something I'm very proud of. <laughs> you, you mentioned the foundation, and we've talked about this before. What was your your role initially with the foundation, and and you know, we were where, where did the concept come up, and where did you actually see? Like, what was your idea for the foundation? Yeah, so the, the foundation uh, kind of evolved into what it is today, mostly because I didn't really know that what the foundation is today could even exist in a world. Uh, I didn't know that there would be uh, this quickly companies that can afford to. You know, drop 50k a year, 100 thousand dollars a year. I didn't know that we'd have Bitcoin companies 2015 raising 75 million dollars. I just didn't. I, I was hopeful, but that this is stuff that's beyond my wildest dreams. You know, um, Bitcoin Foundation um, can find itself uh, conceiving in in two places. For for many for a long time, many months, including the forums, people were talking about the idea for some sort of uh, uh, mutual uh, organization where the Bitcoin companies at the time, because mind you, there were really only five to ten Bitcoin companies at the time. Now you're talking about hundreds, if not thousands, of Bitcoin companies. Um, there were maybe five or ten total. We all knew each other. We all had each other's cell phone numbers. We were all working very closely together because this thing was our baby. You know, it's like we all had stock or shares in each other's companies because we all wanted our, each other's companies to grow, but we all decided early on, like, let's help each other grow this pie, and then we'll fight over the pieces because the pie is too small to fight over right now. So, you know, under that premise, the Bitcoin Foundation kind of came in. I remember the first time in person talking about it was uh, at someone early 2013. Uh, Gavin uh, Andreessen and I were sitting at a cafe in Austria, um, Cafe Lulz, actually, um, and there was a, a big... Uh, uh, and I have the video of it, a big uh, anti-SOPA uh, net neutrality uh, uh, thing going right outside, big rally, a big protest, right out the windows uh, of us sitting there. We were with Roger Veer, Eric Voorhees, uh, a bunch of other people in the Bitcoin space, the Bitstamp guys out in Austria working on uh, the Mycelium project with the Mycelium guys. And um, I looked at Gavin and I said, Gavin, how do, we, how do we kind of like organize this thing here? Like we have this Bitcoin thing. I know it's not even your full-time thing yet. Like, how do we, how do we kind of do this? And he said, uh, "Well, I, you know, I was talking about this foundation thing on the forums for a long time. Let's see if we can make that together." And I called over Roger. Roger was sitting at another table. I called over Roger and I called over Eric. I'm like, "Roger, would you put money into this thing?" Roger said, "100%. Let me know where to, you know, where to send the Bitcoin to. Let's let's start this thing." And that's really kind of where the foundation started. We went back to New York. He, I went back to New York. Uh, Gavin went back to Maine. Uh, Massachusetts, sorry. Um, a, f a week later, uh, Gavin emailed me, introduced me to Peter Vestness, who was out in, in Seattle trying to raise money through his coin lab st uh, uh, thing to uh, raise money for, and and uh, all got together and and see that. And it really started as more of a, uh, a how do we all put money together to do like uh, coordinated advertising, 
or coordinated press releases. We just want it to be coordinated. We, didn't, we, we saw this, the negative Silk Road um, press that was going on. We saw the negative press about Bitcoin, and we need a unified voice in answering to the press and to advertising, and we needed a way for new companies to feel that they had a safety net of some sort of organization or foundation that would help them along. And that's why we kind of, those three principles, um, to standardize, protect, and promote the concept of Bitcoin. And that's where we got our thing, the standardize, protect, protect, and promote. You know, it evolved into what it is today, but those are the kind of premise principles of why we started the foundation. <coughs> Do you, do you agree with where the foundation is going now, uh, where Patrick Mark is trying to take it with, you know, just about focusing on the core development right now? Do you think that's a wise move? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, the foundation may have uh, widened its scope too much over the past two years, and what they're doing now is trying to uh, make it narrow again and to choose one specific uh, kind of idea or, or project to work on, which is core development. Uh, I, don't, I don't recall that it is in the exact uh, notion of why we started the foundation, um, but as long as there's transparency in the process, as long as the, the core developers know that uh, the foundation isn't uh, the only uh, voice of Bitcoin. And I've always, I've always said that the foundation really needs to make this point uh, specific that the foundation represents its members. It doesn't represent the, the Bitcoin community as a whole. And that's very important to, to remember. Um, the foundation represents its members and its members alone and not, it, 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 it looks out for the interest in the overall Bitcoin community, but it doesn't represent all Bitcoiners. And that's not why we started it. We started to represent the Bitcoin companies and the individuals that paid to be members of the foundation. Yeah, in my opinion, I think it's a, bit of, it's a smart move switching over to the protocol. There's so many other organizations right now that, are there that can start filling in the gaps and filling in and doing all the other things that they initially wanted to do. So I think it makes sense of what they're doing. You had mentioned earlier about uh, companies working together back in the day. You still think it's that's what we're seeing right now? Do you think it's more competitive, or do you think we're still at the time where we have to all still work together because we are going to, to the common goal? Or do you think it's now all about competition? Well, it's both. It's both. Um, within the Bitcoin space, we're seeing a lot more collaboration in the space. We're seeing companies work together. Everyone's somewhat nice to each other, uh, except for the scam companies. Um, and that's great. But my problem is, is... I get nervous when it comes to um, altcoins. And I'm not talking about Ethereum or Ripple. I'm talking about altcoins. Altcoins as a concept is a genius idea. How do we take a, a, an idea or a change in the core protocol of Bitcoin and experiment it in the real world, not on a test net? with real people, because at the end of the day, Bitcoin is, is a socioeconomic experiment. Half of it's the code, but half of it is how do people react to how Bitcoin works. So you take, you take principles like even the proof of work, changing over to proof of stake and things like that, and that's what all coins were trying to be originally. They're trying to be like, how do we experiment on these new things? But the problem is, is all coins go against my, uh, they go against my uh, fundamental belief of what money is. And all coins are creating new value out of thin air and kind of diluting the uh, cryptocurrency space by creating new money. Now, you look at a project like Sidechains, and Sidechains is trying to change that. Whether or not it will succeed, I don't know. But Sidechains is essentially trying to take that concept of altcoins but making it beneficial to the greater Bitcoin community. It's kind of like if all pharmaceutical companies took their R&D and work together on that, and then made it all work for each other's companies. It's kind of like the altcoins were the chemist's laboratories for Bitcoin, but now all the R&D research and development uh, and the testing will go towards the uh, Bitcoin blockchain and mainchain and make it stronger and more powerful. And that's what I'm a big fan of. We're seeing scams, as you mentioned, they're getting more and more sophisticated right now. What can we do, you know, as people that are you know, evangelists for the space, what can we do to 
know, make people aware that are perhaps are susceptible to these these scams. Like, how do how do we make it so that like I'm I'm just seeing the advancement of them going so much more, where the marketing is getting so much better. They're they're knowing what to do to fool people, and there's so many pump and dumps going on, and so much more. How do we work to educate people about this? Because I just see it getting worse and worse. It was it was less um, that the scams were were uh, advanced, but more they were quiet. Now these scams realize that they could be as quiet as they want to be, but the Bitcoin community will easily call them out on it. So they, like you said, they get more advanced and they get better at what they do. And you look at, uh, you know, I don't know, well, I think that Paybase and Paycoin are a pretty confident <laughs> it's a scam. But at the end of the day, I, I, I could be 99.99% sure, but I don't have all the facts. I wish I did. Um, but the Bitcoin community, I think, is doing a very good job, and I do. I think the Bitcoin community is doing an excellent job um, at calling these out. Um, I think it was very good for Mo Levine to not block Josh Garza from speaking at the conference because that's what Josh Garza wanted. If we had blocked him from the conference, he would have went out on his forums and said, oh, look, they're scared of us. You know, They know we're legitimate. Let him come. Let him speak. And that's exactly what happened. He chickened out. He showed up with two bodyguards. And no one took him seriously. We need to be a completely transparent and open community. And that is very important because we will call them out. We, it'll happen very easily. So you started a new project called Action Crypto. Talk a little bit about what it is, where the concept came from, and what your plans are with it. Yeah, so Action Crypto was started, uh, actioncrypto.com was started by uh, a few friends of mine here in the New York uh, area. They've worked on it for, for over a year now. Uh, recently brought me on to, to help out with some of the marketing. Um, but it's a really cool project. Uh, essentially, Action Crypto is a way, I was really impressed to go back with Satoshi Dice. And I was really impressed with Satoshi Bones and a lot of these uh, on-chain Bitcoin gaming sites where it's impossible for the operator to cheat anyone. I've seen so many poker sites and Bitcoin gam and sorry, not Bitcoin, but gambling companies uh, steal users' money. Um, I've seen binary option sites not give not give people that their money that they want and everything. I've seen the biggest scams have come from the internet gambling space. And so you take something like Bitcoin, and Bitcoin requires transparency. And Bitcoin allows for on-chain um, gaming. And that, I think, is one of Bitcoin's low-hanging fruit of utility. That's saying, wow, we have Bitcoin, which allows for transparency, allows you to not cheat someone, and it is super transparent. Proof of reserves, provably fair. And so uh, we started actually Crypto as a site to allow people to uh, buy an option on what they think the future price of Bitcoin is going to be. So if you think the price of Bitcoin will be up in one minute, you could buy an option on that, and if the price goes up in one minute, or it's higher than the price that when you'd purchase that option, you'll win 30% of your money plus the original bet back, and you could buy an option for a day even, and win almost double your money. Um, and we've done over almost 3,000 Bitcoin worth of options in the past 30 days. It's been really popular. A lot of people are liking it, more, more or less because we never have to deal with customer service emails. We never do, because... Everything just works on its own. The blockchain is its own independent body. A bet comes in, we watch an address. As soon as an address sees an option come in, it automatically starts the option time, and if the customer wins, we send the money right back to him. There's no way we can cheat someone because everything is on the blockchain. As soon as someone sends a, an option, we see the timestamp, and if we screw up, customer can email us and say, look, I sent you this amount of money, and the bet started at this time. I and then he checks the price fee. That's also transparent, and he says he should have won, and and he should have won. So there's no way we can cheat anyone, and that's the best part about it. You're in New York. I'm not sure, but something like that sounds like it's probably regulated. Is there anything you had to do to? Yeah, I said I said goodbye to the to United States consumer base, and I just we just. One of the first things I did before we launched was we just blocked actually crypto from any United States customer. Like if you go to the site for the United States, uh, it'll just won't it won't even let you see the addresses. It'll just say it'll give you a warning sign and say sorry, you can access the site because you know what I've 
I've had my own legal runnings with, with, with the U.S., and if they want to get you, they'll get you. So it's just not even worth it. Uh, we're doing so much business outside of the U.S. The Bitcoin community exists. A uh, large portion of our business comes from Canada. Uh, we do a ton of business from India, uh, Singapore, uh, even Europe, Indonesia, um, everywhere, South America. The Bitcoin community is growing. Turkey, Turkey is huge now. Czech Republic, Bitcoin community. This, this has given me an opportunity to really see where other Bitcoin communities are, contacting local Bitcoin community websites, advertising with them, supporting them financially. Um, it's really a wonderful thing to see. So, you know, it's really nice. Uh, I think the United States lost its opportunity to be the uh, central hub for Bitcoin uh, about a year or two ago. And you know what? Most of my friends left the U.S. and I'll probably be gone at some point. Um, whether I come back and forth, yeah. Sounds, sounds like you might not be allowed to come back and forth. I mean, dealing with what Roger's dealing with right now. You know, he's uh, paid his taxes. He decided to leave the states, and now he can't even go back and visit or go to conferences. Uh, yeah, well, Roger. Roger renounced his citizenship, which for him was a very. I'm just looking for my charger. Uh, was a very smart move for him. Um, because, uh, hold on one second. <laughs> Talk, talk about Roger a bit. Sorry, I had to mute myself. My computer is about to die. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you fine. Okay. No, Roger, you know, Roger, he's, he's one of my uh, mentors. He's uh, been one of my best friends since, since the early days of Bitcoin. Um, he... Uh, moved out of the United States about 10 years ago. Uh, hasn't made a dollar in the United States since then. Uh, Roger was very wealthy before Bitcoin. Everyone should know. Very, very, very wealthy. His, his business is very successful in Asia. Uh, has lived outside of the U.S. for the past 10 years. Uh, pays Japanese taxes. But as we all know, the United States is only one of three countries in the world, I think, that requires you to pay taxes even if you don't live here anymore. So here Roger is paying millions and millions of dollars a year in taxes to the United States for no reason. Um, and so Roger took it upon himself to renounce the citizenship after receiving secondary citizenship, but uh, Roger paid um, an exit tax. Now, an exit tax, in Roger's case, is more taxes. Uh, he paid that one check that he wrote is probably more money than all of you guys in this room, including myself and Anthony, will ever pay in our lifetime. He paid, had to pay 30% of all of his assets to the United States just to have permission to not be a citizen anymore. You're talking about tens of millions of dollars he paid. And I asked Roger, I said, Roger, not that I condone anything illegal, but you have, you know, you more than anyone have the ability to hide your money. You know, you could keep it in Bitcoin, you keep it offshore banks, you know how to do this. And he said, Charlie, as much as you and I know that's true, I'm not going to do that because I want to be on good terms with the government. He, he said that I want to be on good terms with the U.S. government so that once I do renounce my citizenship and I do apply for a visa to come back, they'll give it to me because they'll say, look at this guy, Roger. Yes, he renounced, but he paid 30% of his taxes, of his, of his wealth in taxes, a multi-million dollar check, we'll let him back into the country. Anyways, backfired on him because he won't even let it back into the country. I'm going to encourage you, Charlie, stop giving advice to people on things like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasn't giving him advice. It was more like asking to Roger, you know, like, what's your plan? What's your tax plan? Are you going to pay it all? Are you going to declare everything, including your Bitcoin assets? Like, I'm curious to know what you're going to do. And he said, Charlie, I'm declaring everything. I'm, I'm declaring everything. I want to do this the right and kosher way because I want to be allowed back into the U.S. And it backfired on him. So you, you talked a little bit earlier about the problems that you've had. Are you happy with the results and, and how things have, I mean, obviously not, you're not fully happy with it, but are you happy with um, basically what's come out of the situation? Can you talk a little bit about what's going to be 
going on with you in the next few months and perhaps a year from now? You know, when they arrested me uh, about a year ago, uh, about about a year ago and five days from now is the one year anniversary of my arrest. Um, they uh, slapped me with three major charges under the Patriot Act and told me that you're going away for 30 years. And in fact, most of those crimes did have mandatory minimums. Um, I thought I was. And for a very long time, sitting under house arrest with an ankle bracelet on, uh, I came to the, to the conclusion that I'll probably be going to jail for some, some period of time. You know, I'm fighting against the government. Charlie Shrem, Jewish kid from Brooklyn, is fighting against the United States. I mean, even looking at the, the docket, you're looking at the, 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 uh, the case files, is the United States of America versus Charlie Shrem. It hits you. It's scary. Um, but I fought every day with the support of my girlfriend and, and my friends and the Bitcoin community and, and everyone. Uh, we fought every day. We woke up and fought, and we went to depositions and went to hearings, and uh, we argued with judges, and we had sealed hearings, and a lot, you know, about 70% of this legal battle went on behind closed doors that I'll be talking about in my book, hopefully. Um, there's a lot that actually went on this past year. It was a very, very big fight, uh, and even when I when I uh, signed my plea deal, um, two important things. One. The government can't guarantee you a certain amount of time. Only the judge can. So even when you make a plea deal, you can't make a deal over how much time you'll serve. And two, I declined to be a government witness, so I did not. I did not uh, go forward and become uh, like a government. Um, uh, 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 I don't know if the word is like a government uh, uh, helper to, for Bitcoin, whatever. I, I I I wasn't becoming that. So I totally cut off my ties to the government and I don't have to deal with them anymore. Um, and I was still facing something like five years, even though I really hoped for it and thought I would get no jail time. But the government decided to make an advantage of to take an advantage uh, to make an example of me um, and give me about two years. Uh, thankfully uh, with the time served under house arrest and various uh, drug abuse programs that I'll hopefully get into, uh, I should serve uh, somewhere between seven and nine months uh, in, a, in a federal prison camp here, which actually is a very good spot to teach people about Bitcoin because you're talking about, like, judges, lawyers, <laughs> corrupt cops, uh, you know, Bernie Madoff types. Those guys, like, need Bitcoin, so it's the perfect spot. I'll teach Bitcoin classes, you know, like, it'll be great. I'll have a good time. <laughs> I, I love your optimism. That's, that's, that's great. It could have been so much worse. I finally have a date. I have a... a it's a, it's a it's a light at the end of the tunnel. I have a date when this is all over, and I can move forward with my life. And and this time next year, I'll I'll be done with it. But all the whole thing will be behind me, and I'm moving forward. And any idea when that will start? Uh, I'm supposed to go in sometime mid March, but I'm I'm trying to push it off to the end of March. What, 62 days? Something between 60 and 75 days. Yeah, maybe a little bit longer than that. All right, I think we want to open it up to the audience here, perhaps have some questions for Charlie. Susan, and just let us know if you can hear okay, Charlie. Hi, Charlie. Um, my sympathy is to you. I just wondered what you thought about the price of Bitcoin. It's really been high now for about a year, and it just seems to be the opposite of what's happening with Bitcoin, all the great things the companies have been on board. Do you think this is it? Is it stabilizing maybe around 200? You know, it's funny because I've lived through, I think this is like my fifth bubble that I've lived through. Um, and that question that you've asked me, I've been asked every six months over the past like five years. Um, when the price went from like 50 cents to like $10 and back down to a dollar and then went from a dollar to 36 and back down to like six and then went from that to like 256, then back down to like 65. When that happened, when it went from like 65 to like, from 256 to like 60, people, there was blood on the streets. Like people were selling in mass. People were done. Bitcoin closed up shop at that point. Like it was just done. And then we went to 1200. Uh, and then now we're back down to, to something. 
Um, so is this over? No. Uh, is Bitcoin in a bubble cycle? Probably. Is it manipulated? Probably. Are there whales that manipulate? Probably. Um, is the Bitcoin price a sign of the uh, overall Bitcoin economy? No. Uh, but I will tell you this. Um, buy Bitcoin now. <clears throat> buy Bitcoin right now, and in five years you won't be sorry. I always say to someone, like, buy Bitcoin and and don't sell it for five years because Bitcoin is either built to appreciate or die completely. So the short-term price movements, and yes, going from 1300 to 200 is only over like a one-year span. It could go to 10,000, it could go to 500 and stay there, it could go to a million, we just don't know. But I always like to look at five-year charts. So ask me again in five years, and if the price is lower than 200, you can have all my Bitcoins. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we'll hold you to it. Anybody else? Yes. Thanks, Eddie. Hey, Charlie. Uh, my name's Royce. Uh, sorry to uh, you know hear about your whole predicament. I've been following it. It's been happening too. It's uh, really awful. Uh, so uh, I, I'm also from New York State. A quick question: Do you think uh, the new big license has effectively cut out New York City and New York State? Uh, from any sort of Bitcoin operations or Bitcoin businesses going forward. Yes, definitely. Uh, there, there isn't, there aren't much Bitcoin companies based out of New York anymore. They pretty much all left. I mean, there's, there's pretty much Coinsetter. Uh, yeah, really not much else. Celery and a few other small ones, but uh, I think the Bit license is just like validation to be able to operate. Don't forget, big license is going to be expensive. And I'm really happy that they came out with this like two-year grace period or whatever it was that if you can't afford the license, that's really important because that'll allow Bitcoin uh, companies to succeed. But I think the bit license was more of like a like a like a validation towards institutional investors that want to buy Bitcoin because these guys need to know that there is some sort of regulation in this Bitcoin thing. And the things like the bit license will just be like one stone on the pathway towards things like ETFs and more institutional ways for buying Bitcoin and selling Bitcoin. There comes like Coinbase that raised $75 million, a total of $106 million. Uh, we're going to see Bitcoin companies raise $500 million, maybe even a billion. I mean, these companies are building on the Bitcoin infrastructure. And a Bitcoin is owning a share of that infrastructure, essentially. Um, and so I think uh, that the bit license is something that was uh, inevitable. So it's, it's going to happen. Uh, whether or not we like it uh, doesn't really matter because it's going to happen. And with any product that comes out, like Bitcoin or whatever, even before, um, there's always some, some regulation. New York has always been the first ones to like in, introduce something like this and the rest of the states will follow. So the question isn't, do we like it? How do we get rid of it? It's how do we make it work for us the best? Um, and I know people hate on the foundation, but right now the foundation is really the only uh, foundation and its affiliates, including Jerry Brittle's Coin Center um, and the, the Chamber for Digital Commerce, are the only ones actually engaging with the uh, regulators to make this happen, to make it work for the best of us. Because what if they had, what if they had actually launched without that grace period? That would have sucked, because all these companies would overnight become illegal. And now there's like a two-year kind of grace period. And things like that is important. That's why we need to, to reach out. So yes, uh, something like the bit license was inevitable. Uh, it's important because um, I think that there needs to be some sort of level of of consumer protection. And going back to scams, um, you realize that once. This com something like the bit license comes out and and if a company that is licensed decides to run away with everyone's money, there's a better chance of you getting your money back as a consumer than if they weren't regulated by any company. Not to say that self-regulation isn't good. Self-regulation is fantastic. I, I We need self-regulation in the Bitcoin space, but I don't think we're at that point yet. Um, and so, but at the end of the day, you don't need to use these companies, right? Like I don't. I have a ring on my finger that I made myself, and on my on my ring is a is a private key engraved under there, and it has a a, a BIP38 encrypted key. So even if you you know take a picture of this the private key here, I could even 
you know, copy and paste it to you, you can all read it. There's another password that only I have in my head to unlock the bitcoins that are on this ring. And that, you know, this ring is not licensed by New York. This is licensed by Charlie Shrem, and that's my ring. And these are my bitcoins. <laughs> You, um, Melgox, sorry, MT Docs. Let's talk a bit about that. Did you ever have a, a, a relationship with Carpelli's? Did you own very well? Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on what happened with Docs? I had a weird relationship with, with him. A lot of people had. Um, the relationship extended. Mark would never answer emails, never answer phone calls. The only way to get in touch with Mark is through IRC chat rooms. And you'd have to con send a private message to Magical Tux during a certain time frame. And he cared about nothing. So you'd essentially have to, like, have favors built up with him. And I remember, like, for example, I'll give you an example. Like, Mount Gox went down. The APIs were all fucked up. And he did, I did instantly needed a private API to Mount Gox to do transactions because their public API was just getting hammered at DOS. So I went to my, my CTO and I said, Alex, uh, can you reach out to Mark uh, and and ask him to fix this? And Alex is like, oh, I just I just used up a favor with. I just talked to him yesterday for something else. He won't answer me for another like six weeks. So now you have to use yours, and like you have to build up things with him. He's a weird dude. He was always a weird dude. Like he didn't. He just never cared about anything, you know. Like remember, like Mal Gox went down the first time, and it was like a. Friday and, and Roger and Jesse were like helping him out and, and Roger's like to Mark like what time do you want me to come in tomorrow like Saturday morning to help and Mark's like no problem we'll deal with it on Monday and like you're shut down your customers are all their monies are lost you've been hacked everyone's flipping out people have you know hits out on you you want to go back to work on Monday like he just didn't care about anything I don't know if that was personality or what it was but <laughs> it was so weird he was one of the hardest off. people that I've ever had to work with, and I and I and there were some days where I hated working with him and loved it because I would beg him to do things like just edit one line of code. One line of code would take a groveling. I think I have some of the IRC logs I've kept in. I grovel with him, I'm like Mark, please do this. I will send you. He loved hummus. I like Mark. I will send you hummus from New York and 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 schnitzel. Because he loved that. If you just edit this one line of code, you would say, oh, I'm going to go feed my cat, and then I'll do it in an hour, and then disappear for three days. And then he would do it. <laughs> now, any thoughts about, about Gox itself and, and what happened? Do you have a theory? I just I, I think he lost those coins early on, like many years ago in that first hack. He lost those coins. Um, and instead of trying, instead of launching and saying we took a 10% massive hit, don't forget Bitcoin was a dollar or two back then, or ten dollars or whatever it was. So uh, you're talking about like the money that <clears throat> the money that today is worth hundreds of millions was only worth single millions or tens of millions. So a lot less, a lot, a lot less. Then Mark just figured, hey, we lost ten million dollars, but we have a billion dollars on assets, or we have five hundred million dollars on assets. I'll just tell people that we didn't lose anything, and I'll figure out how to either run a, a fractional reserve or I'll figure out how to buy back those coins over time. And that's what he figured he'd do. Um, and if you actually look at, at Mt. Gox's old blog post archives, you can see he wrote, like, you know, we got hacked, we're back up. Everyone, we didn't lose any money. Everyone has all their money. We're good. No one lost any money. And everyone would be like, how is that even possible? Like, we see the Bitcoin exiting your addresses, but no one really questioned it because everyone was happy that they got their money. Uh, and so I think that's what happened. And then as the price went up, he didn't have enough dollars to buy back um, Bitcoins to fund. And then when people started realizing this, he started having withdrawal delays and, and the Ponzi started unraveling, and that was it. And, yeah, you could blame it on things like transaction malleability and blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, that's what I think happened. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Andrew. What advice would you give to your folks that are starting out just in terms of not getting themselves into a situation where they're on the wrong side of a regulator or on the wrong side of the law? Don't operate in the United States. <laughs> um, no, but seriously, um, 
make sure you're not screwing anyone over. Make sure you're not like uh, operating some sort of scam or Ponzi, because then you'll have consumer protection, SEC related stuff. Make sure you're not uh, money laundering or have any involvement with drugs. Even even if it's an email from a customer saying you didn't credit my Bitcoin at Silk Road, that's what that that was a smoking gun for me. Even something stupid like that, um, you just got to be very careful. Um, but go after the low-hanging fruit. I mean, there's so much there's so much uh, low-hanging fruit in terms of Bitcoin right now that that like allow for Bitcoin's utility to really grow. Uh, go after that stuff. Um, I think if we stick to the stick away from the drugs, the, because at the end of the day, they need a smoking gun, right? You could be operating without a Bitcoin license, like Coinbase did for a while, even though they have multiple licenses now. Nothing will happen to them because there's no smoking gun. Because at the end of the day, they need to know that they need to be able to scare you in front of a jury. Like for me, all they need to do was put up a, a you know a nice lady whose son died from a, from a meth overdose or cocaine overdose, and the jury would convict me for 30 years. Even though it has nothing to do with Bitcoin or, or whatever, but that's what they were able to do for me. So they scared the shit out of me. So make sure there's no like smoking gun or nothing related to drugs, money laundering, terrorism, or whatever, and you should be okay. Yes. Yeah, I'm wondering uh, what two or three companies or four companies you think will become the most prominent over the next couple of years. Like the, uh, if you could predict, like the next, you know, Facebook or Google. Is it Coinbase? Is it, uh, you know, a certain exchange that you like, or what are your thoughts? Uh, I, I like Coinbase a lot. I like the guys behind Coinbase. I think they have a solid team, uh, good people. And as much as we hate on the U.S., there needs to be the one or two U.S. Cost companies. Who do to do it right? The United States needs to have some sort of uh, Bitcoin foothold, and so these companies will succeed. I think Circle had an opportunity, but they kind of uh, bombed it. Um, I myself have a lot of problems with Circle, and I think Circle lost a lot of market share in the first few months of launch. Um, I see a lot of these smaller Bitcoin gaming sites is doing really well in the space. Make it, I mean, the, the, your question is like, which companies will make money? Which ones will have users? Um, I know blockchain.info is trying to become like the Google of Bitcoin. Um, it's a really hard task, but they have a solid team of good people um, that I, I know most of them personally. Um, and so I think blockchain.info are going to do some amazing things. Um, and I see the Chinese companies really doing OK Coin, OOV, VTC China, doing a lot of great stuff. Um, I'm so sick of Bitcoin exchanges, though. It's like I feel like every day another Bitcoin exchange launches. So uh, you need you need all the Bitcoin companies that come out of any community though. You need products like Decentral.tv. You need media companies. You need Bitcoin Magazine. You need the, you need the community. You need the guys selling T-shirts for Bitcoin. You need all of it. You need you need everything. Um, and I think you're going to see big big companies very prominent like Coinbase, uh, Blockchain.info. Um, Gift, Gift is a fantastic company. I love Gift. Uh, companies that really play on the utility of Bitcoin. I keep using this word utility a lot, and a lot of you guys don't know what it means. Maybe utility is essentially taking something that Bitcoin does better than other things and using it to people's advantages. For example, micropayments. Up until Bitcoin existed, no one has really figured out how to really successfully do micropayments for a number of reasons. Bitcoin companies like Change Tip really. Uh, allow for to really maximize Bitcoin's utility. Uh, On-chain proof of of of, uh, of um, solvency. Bitcoin gaming sites is another one. You look at companies like um, uh, you look at products like um, um, just all of them, just tons of them um, that allow for that. The low-hanging fruit uh, remittances, um, just, uh, underbanked, uh, be able to allow someone. In, in Central Africa to have a bank account on his phone. Things like that are really important. And I think companies that really play on that utility will succeed in Bitcoin. Yes. Uh, have your politics changed since you started with Bitcoin, aside from like just a general increased wariness of government? <laughs> you know, I was, I was uh, someone, I think, this is the president of blockchain.info, Peter Smith, He's a good friend of mine. He said, Charlie, you are so painstakingly naive. I am just very naive. 
I trust I trusted too many people early on. I I uh, allow for people the opportunity to screw me over. Uh, I allow um, politicians to have benefit of the doubt, uh, and I made a mistake. I thought if I was uh, upfront with the government and if I talked to them and I helped them, which I did a lot, I was and I still am very close with a lot of the the the, the regulatory departments. Uh, in New York, I uh, worked with them for many years, just educating them on Bitcoin, um, teaching them about it, and basically stopping them from pushing that red button. You know, we always imagined that we were in the regulator's office, they had their finger on a red button, and the red button was about to arrest everyone in the Bitcoin space, and our job was to like explain to them that Bitcoin's amazing and to not push that red button, but I feel like they pushed that red button for me. Uh, so yes, my politics have changed. Um, what they are, I don't know yet. Um, I was never affiliated with any political group. Um, I'm not a libertarian. I'm not an anarchist. I'm not a, uh, a statist. I'm somewhere in between. Um, I'd say I'm a, I'm a purist, Bitcoin purist, I'm a software purist, and I believe that technology uh, has the ability to change the world. Uh, I kind of call myself uh, as someone of like a, an apostle of Satoshi Nakamoto to, to not use religious terms. Um, kind of a, a, a crusader um, for, a, for what I hope is a new, better tech-driven society because I believe technology, Bitcoin included, uh, will require transparency. It will root out corruption. It will root out middlemen. It will root out third parties. And it will root out the ability for someone to take advantage of you just like I was taken advantage of. Okay. Yes, hello. Okay, um, Charlie, very sorry about what happened to you, but um, I read your indictment actually, and I have a question. Do you regret um, ordering uh, experimental, for experimental purpose, from uh, the snippet that I read, uh, that was from an experimental purpose that you bought some drugs off Silk Road. Is, was that a correct, or that was a misrepresentation in the indictment? Oh, I never bought drugs off Silk Road. That was a fabrication. They, they, in my indictment, and I'll release a lot of this stuff later on after I get out. Uh, but they took a lot of things out of context on purpose to make to make me look bad. For example, you guys know when you use Gmail, you have an email thread. There could be like 40 emails in an email thread. Some of the emails in the indictment, they made it look like it was part of the same thread, but it was actually like they showed four out of 35 emails. Um, an example of that being where they had said that I was purposely trying to go around my partner's back and that I've emailed BTC King privately. In, realist, in reality, BTC King, who I now know to be a 50-year-old guy, didn't know how to use the reply to all button. So he'd reply to me directly, and then he'd reply to my partner directly. So my partner and him were having private conversation, while me and him were having private conversation. But they didn't include that stuff of my partner and him uh, in the indictment, just me and BTC King, because they wanted to show that I was skirting the AML laws and I was... Uh, lying to my business partner about what was going on. Uh, the example that in my diamond, all it said was they took a chat that I had with a reporter where I said something about how you could buy brownies off Silk Road. And I think they said they were like, oh, I bought, I bought a brownie off Silk Road as a joke. I never said it was a marijuana brownie. I never bought any meth or cocaine off weed off Silk Road. It was just, quote, cool. I bought a brownie off Silk Road or something like that. Or I bought a brownie, something something to that extent, but it was taken totally out of context. Um, so no, I never I never bought anything off Silk Road. Um, I, I there was no need for it because I live in New York, and everything. If I if I had wanted anything, they have it here. Did you have a question? Yes. Hey Charlie, what are the top three roadblocks that are preventing a wider adoption of Bitcoin? I have misinformation. People still don't get it. Like you can you can walk up to people in the street and you say, "Have you heard of Bitcoin?" And uh, and I've I've conducted this experiment. You say seven, depending where you are, but six to eight out of ten people would say, "Yes, I've heard of Bitcoin to some extent." Now, what is the level of education? I'd say a tenth of a percent to a 50th of a percent, one being knowing nothing, 10 being being Gavin. Like, people don't know anything about Bitcoin. They just see what they read in the newspaper. There's a lot of misinformation. 
there's a lot of not understanding. <clears throat> and we need to give a people a reason to use Bitcoin. One, give people a reason to use it. And two, make them use it without them even realizing that they're using it. So you know, people want Bitcoin, like BitPay, uh, people want Bitcoin to eventually uh, allow for the running of the underlying financial system uh, at some point in the near future. Uh, but people won't even know that that's actually being used for. And so something like that is really important. And I think um, it's going to take a lot of time to take a lot of people. It's going to happen in waves with early adopters, techies, people, friends of, of the early adopters, friends of the, it's just going to, it's going to happen. It's going to take 10, 20 years. Look, I'll tell you one thing. This is my fifth or sixth year in Bitcoin or probably fifth, fourth or fifth year in Bitcoin. It has happened a lot quicker than I thought it was. And, and don't look at the metric, the price, because that is just one metric. Buy your Bitcoins, buy 50 Bitcoins, put it away and don't touch it. And then have another Bitcoin or two and use that to transact with. But your holdings, just, I guarantee you that by the time, like, 25, 30 years, if Bitcoin still exists in 25, 30 years, 100 Bitcoin will be enough to retire on. Anybody else? What would be the well, 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 okay? So, what would be the next few mongox for 2015 and 2016? Ooh, <laughs> okay, this is the last question because dinner is ready. What was the question? <laughs> you sure you want, you want to do that? Sure. The next three or four mongox of 2015 and 2016. Hopefully zero. Uh, hopefully zero. And I and I think. Uh, I think that we're, I think we've avoided the major catastrophes like like my gox. I don't I don't think we'll ever see maybe one or two, but I don't think we'll ever see big ones like that again. Uh, people are becoming more aware of, of their Bitcoin, and I think companies like BitGo, BitGo uh, allows for multi-signature technology um, implemented into exchanges will prevent theft. Um, I think that BitGo implemented into the Bitstamp when they went down was awesome, uh, but I think the companies like BitGo will require um, the moral responsibility for companies to take better care of the money that they're holding for you. So you as consumers of these companies have to go out to them and say, hey, multi-signature exists. Why aren't you using it? And that's really important. Okay. Uh, Charlie, uh, you're a Bitcoin icon. You're one of the guys that inspired me back in 2013. I was, my first event was a Liberty Forum. It was you, Eric, and Rogers on stage. It was the same event that converted Jeffrey Tucker into Bitcoin and a few other people. So, you know, I've done a lot. I, I always look up to you and I'm really excited for when you get out and we can, you know, get to a conference together again because uh, we've really had a lot of fun. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.